Hey, we're so happy you found us online. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at Grace Family Church. We're a community following the call to love God, love people, and make a difference. We meet at four locations around Durban and at graceonline.tv. Go ahead and share this message, or you can download it and listen to it in your car or at home later today. Wherever you are in the world, wherever you're listening from, thank you for connecting with us. And may you be encouraged by the message coming up next. So there we go. We're in this series called The Naked Truth, and uh, we're looking at three kind of big ideas through the series about what it means to be shameless, selfless, and free. And, uh, and again, I just, I'm so excited for the buckets. I want to echo, just get a bucket. I think it's going to be worked out about 800,000 rands worth of groceries that's going to be distributed to those in need over Christmas. Isn't that cool? Um, that's because of your generosity. So thank you for that. Also to welcome, we've got some guys from Red Point Church and from Harbor City Church in Durban. Uh, guys doing incredible work in churches around our city. And we want to celebrate uh, what God is doing through other churches. So welcome, guys. I, I, I know you didn't want me to single you out, um, but it's good to have you guys here. Now, before we jump into the content for this evening, uh, I want to tell you what, who this series is for. And this series is for students who are hoping to date. Hello? Okay, this is good news. This is for young adults who are, or singles who are dating. This series is for married people who want to make their marriages better. Uh, it's for people who perhaps used to be married and are now jumping back into the scary new world of dating. And it's, it's scary because it's not like it was uh, when you were 22 and the world has changed and things have changed. And now there's, there's Tinder and... Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what Tinder is. I'm just trying to be relevant and cool here. I've been out of the game for too long. But anyway, this series is really for anybody who's in a romantic relationship, or who wants to be in a romantic relationship and is trying to figure it out. And to be honest, I think it's more than that. I think this series is, is actually kind of applies to every relationship. I think the principles and the heart of what I want to speak about tonight, it kind of applies whether it's the relationship of parent to child or child to parent, or maybe it's relationships with work colleagues or with your boss or employees or with friends. And, and the thing is about relationships, I don't need to tell you this, but relationships are complicated. Yes, it's complicated when you're 13, it's complicated when you're 16, 26, 36, and 66. And one of the reasons I'm kind of super excited about this series is that, and this message, that it kind of, it gives me an opportunity to talk about some things that, if I'm honest, break my heart. And nothing really breaks my heart quite like watching people destroy their relationships and be destroyed by their relationships. Just this past week, I had a young woman in my office who came to see me for a counseling session. I don't really do counseling. I'm not really good at it, but we've got a team of people who do uh, that really well. But she spoke to me and she, she, she'd, she's got a young son and her husband has just walked out on her. And here she is trying to figure out how to be a single mom to be the best she can be for her boy to try and make ends meet. And yes, she's made some poor decisions. She knows that. She acknowledges that. But it's hard. And she's heartbroken and she's struggling and she's hurting. And for me, watching people make relationship decisions that ultimately undermine their relationships, hurting themselves and hurting those around them, it, it breaks my heart. Because it's making what is already so complicated even more complicated. And you know and I know that there is already enough unavoidable pain in this world. The last thing we need to do is add to it with our own decisions. And sometimes, if I'm honest, I kind of watch people make relationship decisions from a distance, and I think, ooh, like, that's not going to work out. Really? Is that what you're going to do? Like, I know it works out on Netflix, but have you ever really seen that actually work out in real life? And let me say, I'm, this is not something I'm removing myself from, oh, those idiots over there making poor decisions. I'm talking about the own, my own poor decisions that I make as a husband, 
just about every week, that, that my own poor decisions that I make as a father to my boys. I mean, just this week, uh, my, my oldest son, Will, I was, he was asking if he could watch some more TV. And I said, no, boy, you've already watched TV this morning and you can't have more screen time. He says, why not? I said, because screen time, it makes your brain fuzzy. It's not good for you. And he immediately came back and said, well, but you and mom are the worst because you guys are always on your screens. Type, 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 type. And he's true and it's, he's right. And I felt God speak to me through that. I thought, you know, this is absurd. Why would I scroll through someone else's feed of someone else's life that doesn't even know me or care about me when my beautiful blue-eyed boy is sitting in front of me desperate for my affection and my attention and my time? And it's crazy, isn't it? And yet this is the world that we live in. I took someone's phone in the morning service and I took a selfie from the stage. It was awesome. We live in a selfie-obsessed world. I read a statistic that there have been over 300 selfie deaths in the past few years. Yeah, you heard me right. Selfie deaths. People literally like backing up off the edge of a cliff like, you know. <laughs> ah! <laughs> At least they got the shot. You know what I mean? Anyway, I shouldn't joke about it. But I mean, you look around and you see people in the, you know, in the. It's all about the angle, you know, you've got to get the chin. So things are complicated nowadays. And I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure out that the way we're doing relationships in our world is not working. I mean, look around, there's so much brokenness, so much divorce, so much shame and guilt. Uh, Wayne spoke about that last week. Hiding and blaming, victimizing and abusing. It's us versus them. It's him versus her. It's mud slinging and, and finger pointing and we feel it in our bones, something is wrong. And there's so much that we could talk about here about what's wrong and, and where we've missed it and all that stuff. But I want to focus for tonight just on one kind of myth. One myth that, that is so prevalent in our culture that drives so much dissatisfaction and confusion and heartache in our relationships. I mean, Andy Stanley's been speaking about this myth for over 10 years now. And like most myths, when you, once you surface the myth, you realize that it's actually kind of ridiculous when you really think about it. But it, it drives, it's, it's the undercurrent of our thinking and our assumptions about how we do relationships. And that's really what a myth is. It's an assumption. It's an, it's an unexplored assumption. And the thing about in any area of life, whether it's business, financial, relational, whatever, whatever you might do, whenever there's an unexplored assumption, it can be a dangerous thing because it drives our decisions, but we don't always know that it's driving our decisions. And so we make bad decisions. And so this relational myth, it kind of informs so many of our decisions and the direction that we take when it comes to our relationships. And our culture just fuels this myth. This, the, the myth is this, it's the right person myth. The right person myth. And the right per person myth is not that there's not a right person for you. The right person myth is that once you meet the right person, everything will be all right. And all the married people in the room are like, no, no, that's not, that's definitely not true. Because I met him <laughs> and I met her. The myth is once you meet the right person, everything will be all right, regardless of what you do between now and then. And so the way it plays out is, well, I can just do whatever I want. I can, you know, play around. I can, I can treat men the way I want. I can treat women the way I want. I can treat my body the way I want. Because once I meet the right person, well, then everything's going to change and my past will disappear. And so we think our problem is we just haven't met the right person yet. Or you meet them and you move in with them. Or you met them and you married them, but now things aren't all right anymore. And so slowly we come to the, the false conclusion that, hey, I must have chosen the wrong right person. So what do we do? Well, we start looking for the next right person. And when I say it, it sounds kind of ridiculous, but let's be honest, this way of thinking fuels our relationship decisions and it informs the direction that we take. And we lie to ourselves, the reason I'm unhappy now is because I'm with the wrong person. 
And this is not just for dating people. This is for married people. This is for everyone. We think, well, if I could just find the right person, or if I can just fix the other person, turn them into the right person that I thought they were, then everything's going to be all right. And the myth goes deeper than that. It says, if I can find the right person or fix the other person, then not only will everything be all right, everything will be all right, including me. That's the real danger kind of assumption. We think that somehow when we meet that person or change that person, or when the situation changes, then, then I will be all right. Then those habits that I've been formed over those years will just suddenly melt away. And you know, I won't be interested in porn anymore because you know, I've met the right person, right guys? Or that insecurity that I've been carrying is just gonna go away. Or those financial bad habits, those bad spending habits, they're just gonna go away because I'm just gonna meet someone with a little coin and everything will be all right. Not only is everything gonna be all right, but I'll be a better person. And I'm telling you, this idea, it infects our decisions and it fuels our fantasies. No matter your relationship status, this is something we all wrestle with. And we think when we daydream about what if, hey, if only I'd stuck with her, if only I'd married him, if only I hadn't married him. And the problem is this, this, this fantasy that, that is fueled by this myth, the fantasy, it kind of moves away from ourselves. It's not about becoming the right person. It's about finding the right person or fixing the other person. And it's, it's this way of kind of shifting it away from ourselves. And it stops us from looking at our own stuff. It stops us from becoming the person that God has created us to become and to be. And I know, I know, I know, this is not, you know, exciting. This, is not, this doesn't make for great reality TV or great movies. Because, the, because our culture, we're obsessed with people falling in love, aren't we? I mean, that's what the movies are about. That's what makes a great movie. I, I'm not a huge fan of romantic comedies. I'll tell you why. Because you meet the, the main characters right in the beginning of the movie, right? And you know right from the beginning they're meant to be together, okay? It takes them like two hours and 15 minutes to figure it out. And when they, when they eventually do figure it out, what happens? The movie's over. <laughs> because the myth is, once I find the right person, then everything's just going to be all right. We love being entertained by people falling in love. But here's the thing, and Andy says it best, it only takes a pulse to fall in love. But staying in love, was what, which is what we all really want, staying in love requires so much more. And this series is about the so much more. And so our heart, my heart for you, for me as a church, for us as a church, is that, is that you would be prepared, whether you're married, single, dating, divorced, whatever. And even if you're in a kind of a, a committed relationship and you love her and you love him and you have kids together, but maybe you're wondering, is this it? Or maybe you're wondering, can this be fixed? Because it's, there's so much water under the bridge now. God, can you, can you really bring this back? And I would say emphatically, of course he can. Nothing is too far gone for God. Nothing is impossible with God. Amen? But you don't fix it by trying to do what you did in the beginning. And you don't fix it by trying to fall in love all over again. And you certainly don't fix it by trying to fix the other person. You fix it by becoming the right person. That's the, that's the way forward. That's the path to healing and restoration and hope and reconciliation. And this is where the message of Jesus comes alive. This is where the story of Jesus, following Jesus makes all the difference right now in this world, in your life, in your current situation. You see, when it comes to finding the right person, the Bible will not be of much help to you. However, when it comes to becoming the right person, the Bible has much to say to you and to me. And, 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 and when it comes, I mean, that's what, that, that, this is the path. And I honestly believe, and I've experienced and seen this in my own life and watched it in others. I really do believe, whether you're a Christian or not, if you're just kind of checking this whole thing out, I really do believe that following Jesus will make your life better. Not easier. Not more comfortable. Not more convenient, but it will make your life better. And it will make you better at life. 
Following Jesus will make you a better husband. It will make you a better, a better wife. It will make you a better future husband, a better future wife, a better fiance, a better parent, a better girlfriend, a better boyfriend. There is a way forward, and his name is Jesus. And so for the rest of our time together, I kind of want to take a little bit of a left turn right now. And I want to go to a story in the Bible that maybe when I kind of read it out to you, it, it doesn't really, like, what has this got to do with relationships? But hold on, because I think if you can kind of gr grasp the metaphor, if you can see through the metaphor of the story and the model that Jesus kind of uh, 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 provides for us in the story, I think it will begin to make sense for the relationship struggle that you have right now. Because my imagination is that in a room of this size, I really do believe that most of us, perhaps even all of us, have some kind of relationship tension that we're dealing with right now. Some kind of relationship niggle. Maybe it's a, it's a frustration with someone at work. Maybe it's a, a breakdown in a friendship, someone you haven't spoken to. Maybe, maybe it's your mother-in-law. I mean, probably. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your son or your daughter or both a boyfriend, a girlfriend. Maybe it's someone who passed away years ago but has left a mark in your soul. Every single one of us more than likely have some kind of relationship struggle we're wrestling with. And so as I recount this story from the Scriptures, I want you to think of that relationship struggle and then allow Jesus to be, through the Holy Spirit, allow Jesus to be a model for how you move forward in that situation. Can you do that? Because I believe God is here and God will speak to you in your specific situation. But the story I want to tell you is a story about Jesus in the desert. Now, most people think that the story of Jesus in the desert is about overcoming temptation. And while I think it is that, I have a hunch that it's also far more than that. My, my professor of theology, Vainant de Kock, he helped me to see this in a whole new light. The, that, that the story is actually a picture and a model for humanity for how to overcome what he calls liminality. Now, liminality is kind of a big word, but don't be scared by it. The definition of liminality is this. It's the quality of ambiguity or disorientation that occurs in the middle stage, say middle stage, of a rite of passage. In other words, liminality is the way we feel in the space in between. It's an in-between state. The state between dying to your old life and being born again into new life. The space between where something has ended and something is about to begin. It's the space between who you were and who you're becoming. Between what you need to let go of and what you will eventually take hold of. Between where you are now and where you want to be. Does this make sense? Does anyone know the space that I'm talking about? The land in between, this liminal space. Between how your marriage is and how you hoped it to be. Between how the business is and how you thought it would be by now. This is liminality. And the good news is that Jesus shows us how to live in and overcome the disorientation that occurs in that space. So let's jump into Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. Now, it's interesting because the, the chronology of the Gospels here is that Jesus has just come from his baptism where he would have heard the voice of the Father say to him, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And the, and the Bible tells us that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and led by the Spirit from the, from the River Jordan into the wilderness. Filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit. But here's what's interesting, is that after the 40 days in the desert, Jesus is described as being in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I thought about that for a while, and I thought, is there a difference between being filled with the Holy Spirit and being in the power of the Holy Spirit? I wondered. Because something must have happened, because Jesus immediately goes from this desert experience to a nearby synagogue, and he chooses to, this text from the, from the scroll of Isaiah, and, and he reads it out as kind of his, his missional statement, his vocation. This is what I'm here to do on earth, to set captives free, to give sight to the blind. And so for some, the story of the desert may be around overcoming temptation. But for me, there seems to be far more at stake here. 
Because something must have happened in Jesus, in this liminal space, this tough, hard, confusing, disorientating, and even lonely space because there's no mention of the Father or the Spirit in the desert. Something must have happened to Jesus that had a huge impact on his life and on his ministry. And then I asked myself the question, could Jesus have gone to the cross if he hadn't first gone to the desert? And could it be that the space you find yourself in right now, relationally, financially, perhaps emotionally or physically, while it is a place of pain, could it be that it is also a place of preparation? Because isn't it true that God so often does his greatest work in our toughest times, in our desert experiences? And I want to encourage someone here this evening. You think God has left you out to die in the desert, but actually God is preparing you for the purpose he created for you from the very beginning. I thought I'd get at least one amen there. Anyway, whoo, come on. KG, where were you, bro? Uh, oh, thank, thank you, okay. 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. There was a hunger, there was a need. Perhaps there's a hunger and a need in you. Perhaps that's why you're here. During that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, he's questioning his identity. If you really are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. And on the face of it, I think, well, that's not such a big temptation. I mean, I mean Jesus could have done it, right? I mean, he could have turned this. I mean, he did way more impressive miracles, signs and wonders than that. But somehow, this kind of alerts Jesus to the fact that the enemy wanted him to take care of his own immediate needs. To take matters into his own hands. That is the temptation. And it is always the temptation in the liminal space. For Jesus, there was clearly more at stake and his hunger could wait. Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And again, my professor helped me to see this. The imagery that Jesus is using here is a metaphor stolen from nature. It's this picture of a little bird in a nest, a chick in a nest. And how, how does the mother bird feed the chick? Straight from the mouth. It's a picture of utter dependence. And this is the picture that Jesus brings to mind. In the same way, he says, without the words that come from the mouth of God, I'm hopeless. He needed to hear his father's voice and be in his presence. I think the human equivalent for us would be a, a, a newborn feeding at the breast of a mother. You see, the temptation here from the enemy is to be independent to stand on your own two feet and it echoes what was said to adam and eve in the garden that wayne spoke about last week it's saying move away from the presence of the father you don't need god you can do this on your own and the presence here the word presence in hebrew is the word kabot or in the in the greek it's doxa it's where we kind of get the word glory from in the desert, Jesus is reminded that he could satisfy his physical hunger and make you know, bread from stones, but he sees through this and he responds, in God's presence, I will be fed truth. I prefer, he says, to live by every word that comes from my father's mouth. I prefer the doxa of God. Now you might think, well, what, this is, sounds like great theology, Tom, but what has this got to do with relationships? Let me tell you. You see, some of you, and maybe you know who you are. When it comes to your relationships, if you're honest, you've opted to turn stones into bread. You've opted to take matters into your own hands. You've been single for so long. You've been lonely for so long. You've been hurt so many times. You tried to do it the right way and that backfired. And when presented with the option of taking matters into your own hands or trusting in God's ways and God's plans, you chose the former and the lesser. And you can hear it and you can see it in your language. You'll say things like, I know the Bible says, but I know this isn't God's ideal, but you know what? I, I just, this has been going on for so long. 
It's just easier this way. And so I'm just going to sleep with them. I'm, I'm just going to keep serial dating, filling that void. I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep doing that. I know, I know what the Bible says, but, and this is not just for dating people. Turning stones into bread is an ever temptation for every single one of us, regardless of our relationship status. I'm just going to keep watching those videos and visiting that website because, you know, my wife's not really, you know, coming to the party. And so I've got to take matters into my own hands. God doesn't feel present. I mean, I'm in the desert. You know, where's he? Some of you, some of us, we've forgotten what it is to live off the only bread that truly satisfies, and that is the voice of our Heavenly Father. A voice that says we are loved. You are loved. You are made in the image of God. You are a son and you are a daughter of the Most High King. You don't have to compromise. You don't have to sell yourself short because God has a plan for your life. And so the first lesson in navigating liminality is this move, this move from independence to intimacy. It's about laying down your own need to control the outcome and make things happen and trust that God is in control and has a plan for your life, a plan that is far better, say far better, than any plan that you could or I could come up with on my own. But that requires trust and it requires faith. The second temptation, actually the third, but I'm swapping them around. The next, the devil took them to a peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. The enemy is asking Jesus to break his alliance to the Father, to join his team. And he says, if you partner with me, you will have all that you need. Man, that sounds good, doesn't it? All that you need. It sounds good to me. And you've got to understand, Jesus was hungry. He was desperate. He hadn't eaten. He was feeling distant from God. The Bible says Jesus was fully human. That mean he ex- means he experienced the full weight of temptation that we all experience. But he remembers the voice of his father, the, fo- the voice that said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. He'd internalized that voice. It had become part of who he was. And that made all the difference. The second move, if we're to navigate the liminality, the space in between, if we're going to navigate our relationships as well, the second move is a move from idolatry to identity. It's about, it's from worshiping these things in our world and in our lives that promise us happiness, promise us fulfillment, promise us security, promise us value, but never fully deliver. And we're all susceptible to this. We run after stuff because somewhere in us there is a void and we leak affection. And we try to fill it with stuff. We call it retail therapy. (laughs) And with experiences and with relationships. And usually these things are not bad in themselves. But they're only bad when we make idols out of them. When we place our hope and our trust and our value and our identity in those things instead of in God. It's a young swimmer whose identity is so tied up in his performance that when he wins, he's happy, but when he loses, his whole world falls apart. It's a young girl whose boyfriend breaks up with her and she hasn't learned to be comfortable in her own skin. She's hungry for affirmation, so she finds another guy and shacks up with him and gives herself away again and again, hoping to find something that no other human being will ever be able to. To fulfill. You see, you and I, we will never navigate our relationships well until we know who we are first. That's so important. Jesus knew who he was. That's why he could say, Get out of here, Satan. Get lost. I don't need what you're offering. Yes, I'm hungry. Yes, I'm tired. Yes, but I don't need that stuff because I have all I need, and all I need is God. Jesus had what my theology professor calls presence permanence. In psychology, you'll know uh, if you work with children, uh, children have what's called object permanence. They have to develop it. So when a very small baby uh, sees their parent playing, you know, hide and seek, peekaboo, at first when the parent's gone, the, the, the child may cry. Why? Because for them, their brain is out of sight, out of existence. 
They no longer exist. And then eventually they learn, okay, when mommy comes back, when she goes, she's not gone. I just can't see her, but she's still there. It's called object permanence. And we need to develop that same sense with God. Just because we can't see God, feel God, hear God, just because it feels like God is distant, it does not mean that God is not at work. It does not mean that we can't trust Him, rely on Him, cry out to Him. Someone, someone here this evening, you've been in the desert so long, you've forgotten the face of God. And I'm here to tell you that He has not forgotten about you. I know your relationships are a mess and maybe your life is in upheaval, but just because you can't feel Him or see Him or hear Him or understand what He is doing, it doesn't mean that He is not at work right now preparing you for a life you cannot yet see that lies on the other side of the desert experience. The third and final temptation that Jesus faced in the desert it says, and the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, there's the, 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 the question again, then jump off. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Just a little side note. It's interesting to me that the devil quotes the scriptures so much. Just because you watch some guy on YouTube quoting the scriptures. <laughs> If the first temptation was to take matters into his own hands, the third was to take the shortest road, the quickest road, the easiest option. You see, if Jesus were to in fact have launched off the temple and indeed the angels were in fact to have caught him, then what would have happened is everyone would have known straight away who he was, the Messiah, the Son of God. No beating, no betrayal, no cross, no crucifixion. And as many commentators have noted, I'm sure that Jesus would have loved to have bypassed all of the suffering that he would have to endure over the next three years. Taking shortcuts is a very real temptation in the liminal space. And we love to do it here in South Africa, right? Cut the corners. Oh, I'm just gonna, you know. Get pulled over. I'm a pastor. Oh, Fondisi. Oh, and then uh, everyone's doing it. It's okay. The road of convenience, of quick fixes, of comfort. And Jesus' response is very similar to the response we see when Jesus announced to his disciples nearly three years later that he would have to go to the cross to die. And they were appalled, they were shocked. How could it, how could it be? This is the Messiah. In their mind, the Messiah was coming to overthrow the oppressive powers of Rome and restore the, the temple in Jerusalem to its glory. Surely the Messiah would not sacrifice himself. The insistence by Peter that this should not happen draws a sharp response from Jesus. What does Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. You don't know how God works. Here's my point. When it comes to relationships, when it comes to your life at mine, when it comes to finding true fulfillment and joy and contentment and peace, a peace that the world cannot give, there is no easy road. There is no avoiding sacrifice. There is no getting around the pain. The path to real joy, the path to a successful marriage, the path to being a good parent, it winds through disappointment. It winds through hurt. It winds through forgiveness. It goes through the cross. Is that not why Jesus said, if you want to follow me, then pick up your cross and do so? So you thought you were on the wrong road because it's been so hard. And I'm here to tell you, you're on the right road because it's been so hard. I'll close with this. The devil offers Jesus a straight line. Go from being hungry and tired to being recognized as the Messiah immediately. And it seemed like a good option, a great option. It always does. But Jesus knew something the enemy did not. Jesus knew something the disciples could not. Jesus knew that God had a better plan. 
that God had a bigger picture. And I hope that you believe that about your life as well. You see, instead of simply rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem, Jesus was going about making every single human being a temple for the Holy Spirit. Instead of getting rid of foreign powers, Jesus was about making reconciliation possible between all people. Instead of making Jerusalem the center of the world, Jesus was about sending people out from Jerusalem into the rest of the world. He turns the whole thing upside down. But in order to do so, he had to die. And that, my friends, is both the bad news and the good news. All of this stuff, moving from becoming the right per- from, from finding the right person to becoming the right person, moving from independence to intimacy, from idolatry to identity, all of it requires sacrifice. It requires the move from selfish to selfless. From selfish to, that's the title of my message today, it's selfless. That's the only way. And selfless doesn't mean you think less of yourself, it just means you think of yourself less. In a selfie obsessed world, this is the path of the Jesus follower. And it will change your life. It will change your marriage. It will change your relationships. It will change how you parent. It will change your job. It will change your mind. It will change your money. It will change everything. Jesus said it best. Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into His glory. There's that word again, the doxa. But how do we get that glory, you say? Well, Jesus tells us, I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Say plentiful harvest. That is our heart for you. That is my longing for you and for me, that we would have lives of plentiful harvest, that we would have relationships that flourish and thrive in every sphere, in every way of our lives. But a kernel of wheat has to die. That's why we have popcorn today. (laughs) Some of you are wondering, why are we having popcorn? It's not God in the movies. I just wanted to give you popcorn. But I want to be remind, a reminder to you that you may have been enjoying the popcorn while I've been preaching, but a kernel of wheat had to die so you could enjoy that popcorn. I know it's cheesy, but it works. Okay. A kernel of wheat had to go through the fire so that we could have that popcorn. And maybe that's where you are. Maybe it feels like you're in the fire right now. And I want to remind you, there is another in the fire. Hold on, keep trusting. Remember the Father's voice. Remember who you are. Like Mufasa says to Simba, remember, remember. <laughs> I, I, I know, I'm almost done, I'm almost done, I promise. I, I, know pers- I love personality tests. God bless the My- you know, Myers-Briggs. I don't know whoever he is or she is or whatever. The Enneagram, I love the Enneagram. Jess and I, we, she's big into that. I mean, she's a, she's a four, I'm a three. Apparently fours and threes just, we just clash. I've never noticed that, but, um, but you know, I don't know, she's like into it. You know, if the three and the four like get, you know, we team up, we like become a perfect seven and I don't know, it's a whole thing. But, but, but here's the thing, I don't know, but, here, but here's the thing. I, I love those tests, they have their place, but you cannot go on a journey of self-discovery and truly find out what's in you until the seed has been sacrificed, until it goes into something bigger called the ground, until it's broken open and new life springs forth. And you'll never know, you'll never know what is in you. You'll never know what's in that relationship when you live your life selfishly, when you don't sow, when you don't serve, when you don't lay down your life when you hold on to your life. And I really believe that the enemy has got us so trapped, so many of us, so discouraged in our marriages, in our relationships, in our sin, that our seeds are starving, not for a lack of potential, but for the weeds of selfishness. How do you know I'm telling the truth? I'll I'll tell you because this is risky, guys. What if I make all the sacrifices and the other person doesn't? 
What if I give my husband or my wife what their heart desires and they just take and take and take? What if my selflessness is not reciprocated? It's risky. And I'm not going to try to smooth over that. But ultimately, this is about taking the risk of trusting God. Because underneath selfishness is always fear. Fear that if I don't take matters into my own hands, if I don't turn the stones into bread myself, then God will not provide. And so I hold. So the band, as we close, they're just going to sing a little bit of that song over us again. A song of faith, a song of trust. And while they're doing that, please don't leave. Just stay for a few more minutes because I believe God is here and I believe God wants to speak to you and meet with you here in this place. That the Holy Spirit is here. And so right now, where you're sitting, take that little piece of paper on your, on your seat. On the one side, it says selfish. On the other, it says selfless. And what I want you to do just in a minute, don't think about it too much. Just write down on the selfish side, what is that thing that you've been holding on to? What are you afraid of letting go of? That if you let go of, maybe things, you, you don't know how, what the outcome would be. Write that down. What relationship struggle is there? And then turn the, the card around on the other side. It says selfless, and I'm asking, what, are you, what is God asking you to trust Him with? Because that's the real question. Your sexuality, your loneliness, your need to control, your fear of being hurt, the fear of not being enough, that thing that happened to you, that thing they said about you, what is God asking you to trust Him with? It may be one small step for you, but one giant leap for your relationships and your life. And so take a moment to write that down. And then we'll close just by singing the chorus of that song together. Let's do that together now.